power away from the utility industry is by building and owning our own renewable energy generation assets, like a solar installation on a roof um, or a battery storage installation in a, you know, on a brownfield. That is a way that we can take power away from the utility industry and put it into the hands of our communities and the people who will both use it and who have our best interests in mind. The Inflation Reduction Act is that very long piece of legislation that the Biden administration passed in 2022. And one of the most amazing things that the IRA does is make a ton of federal money available to tax exempt entities. So think of like churches and nonprofits and, and schools and municipalities. And basically there is free federal money available to build clean energy projects owned by these public entities. Um, so we are here today with experts from the Congressional Progressive Caucus who are going to explain the details and answer any questions that folks have about how to actually make this happen in your, um, in your town where you live. Um, Heejin is a program associate with the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, and um, they are the experts at the direct pay program and implementation and have been really leading the charge, working with elected officials and advocates and community members across the country. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Heejin. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Lyle. Um, and thank you everyone um, here and the folks at 350 for organizing um, this conversation today. We're really grateful um, for everyone's evening or afternoon for wherever folks are located. Um, yeah, again, my name is Heejin. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm really excited to walk through a high level overview of direct pay today. Um, just for some um, context, sometimes um, direct pay is also referred to as elective pay, especially in any IRS related documents. Um, so you may see that term a lot if you, for example, start Googling around after today's conversation. Um, but for today, I'll be using the term direct pay. Um, folks are free to drop questions in the chat as they come up with them. Um, my colleague Katie, um, who is also here from um, our organization is also online. She'll be helping out um, once we get to Q&A at the end. Um, so, but yeah, again, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We will get to them um, after we run through these slides. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, so first, okay, what is direct pay? So um, in the past, clean energy tax credits had only been available to businesses and corporations um, like investor-owned utilities who were often using these credits for their own profit. Um, but thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA, um, direct pay is now a mechanism by which um, these clean energy tax credits are open to tax exempt entities. Um, so that means that the IRS is giving tax exempt entities um, tax, tax free cash funding in the form of a refundable tax credit for building renewable energy projects. Um, so this is really a historic opportunity um, that will help expand publicly owned energy and save our communities costs on energy over time. And will also create high quality jobs with the labor provisions that are attached to direct pay. Um, and we think that when these projects are implemented really robustly and creatively, can also be done in ways that maximize racial, economic, and climate justice. Okay, so what kinds of projects are eligible? Um, so the type of technologies that I put on the slide are the ones our organization focuses on and the ones that we think tax exempt entities are likely to um, actually take advantage of. Um, so first are uh, renewable energy projects like wind, solar, and geothermal, they're all eligible. Um, also eligible are energy storage technologies like batteries that you'll often see attached to a solar panel system. Um, there's also um, a credit for electric vehicle charging stations, and then also one for, um, they call it commercial clean vehicles, but basically think electric vehicle purchases like an electric bus or an electric van. And then lastly, ground source heat pumps are also eligible. Um, unfortunately, air source ones are not. That's just how the legislation was written. Um, a common question we get a lot is whether energy efficiency and weatherization projects and upgrades are eligible. 
um, and unfortunately not through direct pay. There are other parts of the Inflation Reduction Act that can help with those. Um, it just won't be through direct pay. Okay, um, now who's eligible? Um, as I mentioned, direct pay is specifically for tax exempt entities. So that means local and state government bodies, their subdivisions, their agencies, um, as well as tribal governments and territory governments. Excuse me. Um, also eligible are nonprofits. So think your standard 501c3 nonprofit, also houses of worship, schools, public hospitals, public utilities, and rural electric cooperatives. Um, so to kind of paint an idea of like um, how direct pay can really work in a community and what is possible, um, we wanted to give a few examples. Um, and some of these are based on real life examples that um, we've been lucky to learn about. So one example is that a school could put rooftop, install rooftop solar and use the savings from their energy costs to increase teacher pay, which is what a school did in Arkansas a few years ago. Um, they did this before actually the Inflation Reduction Act, so they weren't able to benefit from it, um, but that would have been an eligible project and they were able to, um, yeah, basically increase the teacher pay and basically reinvest um, costs that would have been spent on energy um, towards reinvesting that in their stuff. Um, also a local city government could buy electric buses to electrify their fleet um, to reduce air pollution and also just save on fuel costs. Um, this year, Seattle bought 43 electric vehicles and with direct pay, they're expecting to receive over um, 300K or about 300K back um, in money from the tax credits. And then as a last example, um, there's a nonprofit um, that we've been lucky to be connected with and they install electric vehicle charging stations um, to improve charger access and equity in California. Um, and basically um, the proceeds from um, those chargers are going to be used to help fund their program programming. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of a, hopefully see how this can be. Um, folks are already taking advantage of direct pay um, and the difference that it can make um, for an entity and its community. Okay, um, now we understand that doing these projects can take a bit of money um, and there are some pros and cons to um, this federal funding coming in the form of a tax credit. Um, so the pros are that unlike a grant, it's not competitive. Um, if you're an eligible entity that does an eligible project, um, you will receive your direct pay money. Um, but the cons are that um, an entity won't receive a tax credit until after completing a project and after filing their taxes to claim um, the tax credit. So that means the entities are responsible for all the upfront financing for a project. And we know that this will probably be the biggest issues for tax exempt entities to be able to take advantage of direct pay. Um, so we've kind of highlighted a few solutions that we think would be um, most relevant for tax exempt entities when having to think creatively about coming up with a funding and financing um, to be able to you know, install solar panels and heat pumps and so forth. Um, so we would just, note and highlight that um, something called double dipping is encouraged and allowed. Um, so that's basically combining um, direct pay tax credits with other sources of federal and state um, funding and grants. So for example, if through another program, um, maybe from an e the EPA or the Department of Energy, your organization gets a grant, you can use that to fund your project upfront. And then after the project is complete, um, claim direct pay tax credits on the back end to basically take advantage of all the public funding opportunities out there. Um, this is a little in the weeds, but I just wanted to flag that um, projects that are financed with municipal bonds or restricted funds, um, there if you um, use those, there are some restrictions on how much money you can get with direct pay and happy to answer more questions about that, but it's a little bit more detailed than the scope of today's conversation. Um, now also to further illustrate um, how much money um, a project or organization can get with direct pay to just kind of show what the opportunity is here. Um, we put on the slides, um, this is the names of those four specific um, clean energy tax credits as part of the direct pay family that our organization focuses on and has the most expertise in. 
and that we also think will be relevant to tax exempt entities. Um, and the credit that an uh, entity might choose to pursue really depends on the kind of technology that their project is using, um, how big their project is and so forth. But um, for each tax credit, some factors that can influence how much money um, a project can get is basically um, if it's a larger size scale project, um, they may be required to fulfill some labor requirements to be able to um, get the full benefit of the tax credit, but also just to ensure that um, the construction of these um, projects is you know, promoting um, the creation of good quality jobs. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, some credits have some bonus credits that are available that can help increase the amount of money you can get. Um, so with all those factors, um, an example that I'll give is with the investment tax credit, because that's um, one that is we imagine will be used very frequently, um, just to illustrate. So depending on how many bonus credits um, an entity qualifies for, um, an entity could, could get 30 to 50, even 70% of the project costs spent on installation, labor, um, and building materials. Um, they could get 30 to 50, even 70% back of those costs of those costs back um, as a refundable tax credit um, with direct pay. So that can be a quite um, sizable chunk of money that can really just help um, give the extra support that a, a project needs to be able to make it financially viable. Okay. Um, so now that we've talked about what direct pay is, how much money you can get back, um, I just wanted to take a step back a bit again, and remind us of like why this is important um, we know that like tax credits aren't the most fun thing to, <laughs> to learn about. Um, and, but the reason we spend all this time looking through IRS regulations and why we're here today is because um, anytime there's federal funding out there, um, we owe it to our communities to fight for it and turn it into an investment um, for marginalized communities. So um, the approach that we have to direct pay is that when we focus resources and support for the deployment of these kinds of eligible projects, in marginalized communities, um, it is really an opportunity to give um, frontline communities who are on the um, facing the climate crisis and pollution, which we know unfortunately disproportionately impacts communities of color. Um, we have the opportunity to kind of give these communities another tool um, to be able to um, not be left behind in the clean energy transition, and then also just be able to develop and expand a local clean energy workforce that can build wealth for the community over time. Um, and further along the lines of advancing justice, um, specifically on um, worker justice. So I alluded to this a bit before, but um, there are some regulations built into direct pay um, requiring that larger scale projects or so projects that produce over one megawatt of energy, um, they are required to um, pay the workers on the project the prevailing wage. Um, and also employ registered apprentices. Um, and this is again to support workforce development um, and support the growth of good green jobs. Oh, excuse me again. Um, but keeping in mind that we're trying to go above and beyond what is required because our goal is really to maximize justice and economic opportunity, um, we'd encourage projects of all sizes to really pursue these labor standards and to go above and beyond by partnering with their local union, for example, um, or creating community benefits agreements, um, which are, for anyone who's not familiar, um, community benefits agreements or CBAs um, are an enforceable contract between um, really all stakeholders in a project. So that can be the workers on a project, the community members who are by the um, project site. Um, so a CBA can include stipulations like requiring hiring targets to hi hire from um, communities and demographics that have been underrepresented in the clean energy workforce, or they can just require that um, the project hire locally, right, to retain the economic benefits for project in the local community. Um, so this can really help ensure that the spending on a project, which can be a lot of money, especially for some larger scale projects, um, actually work as an investment in the community's local green economy. Okay. Um, now to kind of go over like timeline and how this actually gets done. Um, so direct pay was authorized for 10 years. So that's until 2032, because it was 10 years after 
um, the IRA was passed in 2022. Um, so that's um, a good chunk of time for organizations to think um, with about what's possible within the next few years. Um, the first eligible projects were ones that were completed last year in 2023, and we're seeing organizations um, claiming direct pay now for projects claimed last year. Um, so we're kind of seeing the first iteration of direct pay projects. Um, and to give folks an idea of kind of like what goes into building a direct pay project and claiming direct pay, I kind of wanted to walk over some of the big steps. And I wanted to especially kind of focus on the first step. Usually I kind of just go through this quickly, the planning stage, but um, I wanted to focus on it today because in a lot of ways, the planning stage can be the most difficult. It can be the hardest one to get past um, because this is a stage that can involve a lot of community organizing, especially if it's a project that um, is um, involved with the tax exempt entities and will require a lot of community support to happen. Um, so for example, um, if you're affiliated with an eligible entity, um, let's say your employer is a 501c3 nonprofit and you want them to install rooftop solar, it may take some time to um, talk to your facilities manager, your finance department to get on board. And if you're more in a community advocacy role, pushing for an eligible entity in your community to like your local school district or maybe um, your local church um, to, um, let's say, install a geothermal heat pump or maybe um, install an EV charging station. Um, an initiative like that might have to involve mobilizing your neighbors or um, like calling a local town hall meeting. Um, to be able to generate momentum and basically demonstrate um, to a community, especially if it's like a public entity, um, that investment in clean energy is like a community priority. Um, so we kind of just emphasize that like, um, I imagine that a lot of the folks here are already experts on that, but that this stage would probably involve um, just a lot of engaging with all imaginable stakeholders, anybody who could be um, impacted by a potential project um, to be on board and to make sure they have a seat at the table to have a say in the, what the benefits of this project will be. Um, and kind of using that momentum from a campaign like that will probably, your first ask might be asking for um, the entity in mind to do an energy audit, which is basically kind of like doing an analysis of the of how a building or facility uses its energy and just basically seeing what projects could be viable for that space. Um, and then after gathering um, a survey community's needs and concerns, um, the next stage will probably be convincing or coming up with a plan for the upfront financing for a project. So um, we kind of alluded to this on the previous slide on how do I come up, how do I pay for a project? Um, this can also be a very complicated stage, um, but we hopefully provided examples um, and, and more examples in the reports that we'll share today in the link too um, about how entities can come up with um, creative combinations of different funding and financing sources um, to be able to um, make a project happen. Um, and then lastly, we would also just say that in the planning process, this is, would be a good time to engage with your local unions um, to make sure that they can be the ones who are um, contracting for your project. Um, so that was kind of a very high level overview of some of the big steps that might be involved in the planning process. Again, I usually skip over it, but I just wanted to, you know, emphasize it that it is a really big advocacy opportunity um, to be able to create some of the more long term planning that could go into a project before it actually gets to the stage of being built. Um, but once your project is built, it really does get into the more um, mechanics of filing for direct pay. Um, so after a project is built, um, you start this process with the IRS called the pre-registration process. Um, it involves logging into an online portal where you submit information about the project that you completed. Usually things like where it's located and the contracts that you use to build it. Um, and that is done at least, it's recommended to do it at least 120 days before um, the entity files its taxes for the year that the project was completed in. Um, during this 120 day period, the um, IRS will review your information and if all is in order, uh, will issue a registration number for each of the projects um, that you submitted. And then 
um, you will use those registration numbers in the next step to file your taxes um, and to fill out all the relevant tax forms. Um, and then you will receive um, the money from your direct pay tax credit. Um, now, if that wasn't complicated enough, I would like to add just one more layer of complexity because there is something time sensitive um, tied to it. Um, so right now there are applications open for something called the low income communities bonus credit. Um, if folks remember, there are some bonus credits available for some tax credits. And this one specifically um, stacks on top of the investment tax credit and it can increase the credit amount by 10 to 20 percent. Um, and it's for projects that have to fulfill some very specific criteria. It has to be a solar wind project. Usually there are some criteria, but the most common one will be that it's located in a low income census tract. Um, and I'm just flagging that here because unlike any other part of direct pay, it does require a separate application and it is a competitive process. Nothing else about direct pay is competitive, but this particular bonus is, and it's administered by the Department of Energy. So once a year, it opens the application portal and it is currently open right now. Um, they opened it on May 28th, I think, and it's really encouraged that competitive applications um, are submitted by June 27th, because after June 27th, the application is rolling and it's just harder for your project to stand out. Um, getting the timing to have your project be in a place where it can even apply um, is a little tricky. Um, a lot of serendipitous factors have to align. Um, your project has to be, the term is under contract, but not yet placed in service. So that means it's usually at the beginning or in the midst of construction, but it's not actually completed yet. And that is the time when you would apply for this. Um, so anyway, I know that's a lot of information and it adds like, yes, another layer of complexity to this whole process, but I just wanted to flag it because it is time sensitive and we are in this like 30 day period where the application is open. So if any of this sounds like a project that anyone knows of, just know that this exists and we can follow up and provide more resources on it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I know if you forget everything up to this point, which I hope you don't, um, but we are kind of um, always encouraging folks. Um, there are a number of different ways to take action on direct pay. Um, the first is that hopefully after today's presentation, you have a better grasp of what direct pay is. And um, as trusted members of your community, you can help spread the word. Um, if you know of any um, projects that kind of sounded like it fulfilled the criteria that I mentioned, um, you should really tell them that direct pay exists so that when they complete the project, they can get any and all tax credits they're eligible for so they're not leaving money on the table. Um, second, if anyone here, if you're affiliated with a tax exempt entity, we really encourage you to talk to the people at your organization um, and encourage them to think about an energy audit or see what projects could be viable for your organization. Um, and then third, um, there is also an advocacy opportunity here. Um, we wrote some guides for state legislators and local elected specifically on recommended policies that they can adopt to really help um, make direct pay accessible. Excuse me. Um, so as we mentioned, um, we would really love state and local governments to step in and help provide a lot of the funding and financing assistance for tax exempt entities to really be able to take advantage of direct pay. Um, and we would really encourage folks to um, yell at their city council. Well, you can ask them nicely and then yell. Um, and there's uh, state legislators um, to let them know that they should really reinforce this federal opportunity with state and local level support. Um, and then lastly, um, we call on everyone here to see our organization as a resource. We do educational work like um, conversations like these today, but we also offer technical assistance to people who are planning direct pay projects and are trying to navigate all these different requirements and numbers and things like that. So um, we'll provide a link to our interest form um, that will be a way for you to sign up for our email list and basically receive more resources or request technical assistance. Um, but yeah, I will pause there. Um, I'll stop on our last slide, which is basically a link to our website. We have so many more resources. If you're like, oh, wow, I just cannot wait for this to get more complicated. <laughs> and you really want to dive in and learn more. Um, we have a lot more resources um, and also 
some links to our resources from our friends who are also working on this and created some great resources. Um, but yeah, I will pause there um, so that we can um, turn to questions. I know I threw a lot of information at folks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eugen. Really appreciate your expertise. And unfortunately, we can't just press a button on the IRS website and have someone from the federal government come, come build us an electric vehicle charging station. But um, I've seen 350 groups and other groups of advocates do much more difficult organizing feats than, um, you know, than, than something like getting free money for, for a solar installation. So I have no doubt that um, you folks can all pull this off if you put your minds to it. Um, Heejin and her colleague Katie are here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, these can be specific. Um, these can be general, you know, take, please, please take advantage of uh, the opportunity to ask experts questions. Um, you can either put your question in the chat or you can, yeah, why don't, why don't you put your questions in the chat and um, I will read them out. Or if you would like, you can put a, uh, put your hand, like raise your hand on Zoom using the hand raise function and uh, we'll call on you. And I see a first question in the chat, so I'm, I'm just going to call it out. Um, can a prior year tax return be amended to include the direct pay credit? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so the first projects that would have been eligible for direct pay were ones that were completed January 1st, 2023 and onward. Um, so if you're in a position um, where you completed a project last year um, and you didn't claim it, um, it really depends on when you're filing tax filing deadline is to see whether there's still a window of you of, of opportunity for you to be able to take advantage of it. Um, so um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of wiggle room of what can be done if your tax deadline has already passed. Um, but if it hasn't passed yet, or you had an extension, um, there could theoretically still be time for you to take advantage of it. Um, if let's see, so some of the scenarios are if you've already filed, but your filing deadline hasn't passed yet and you didn't claim direct pay, you can file something called a superseding return. Um, that might be too much information. Um, but if your um, filing deadline just hasn't passed and you haven't filed yet, there's still an opportunity. Um, you can try. The first step is to pre-register. Um, so I guess we would just encourage you to pre-register as quickly as possible um, to give yourself the time you need um, to be able to have the IRS get back to you with your registration number for you to file. Um, so yeah, I know in our position, like a lot of maybe nonprofits may have had to have a filing deadline in May. Um, but if you got an extension or if you're with like affiliated with a city government that might not have to filing deadline until November 15th, um, you could still potentially be in a position. Awesome, thank you. Okay, another great question. Do you know communities and or school districts that have successfully filed and already received their rebates? A question from Kevin. Yeah, I think I definitely know organizations that have pre-registered and filed. I don't think that we've heard um, a story of people in our personal like context of people getting their money back yet. Um, there are a couple of, it's because there's some difficulties in that like, um, the we wish that treasury would release some public information on how many people are taking advantage of these credits and how much money is being doled out um, but there's some complications because it's like private taxpayer information so we really have to rely on people to um after we tell them about direct pay to come back to us and tell us how it went um so we're kind of still in this um we're talking to other organizations to think about the best way we can get people to report back their success stories um because we know that everyone is really eager to hear them especially in this first year of um, uptake um and i'm curious for uh kevin who put in that question are you thinking about this as something that might potentially work in your community or in in the school district where you live well i've been uh agitating with our school district and community to move more quickly on this. But we have one community uh, here in the Madison area that has already built a new public uh, safety center that is also net zero. 
and they're expecting over a million dollars back, but I've yet to receive it. Uh, I know Dane County here in uh, South Central Wisconsin is uh, going to publicly announce when that happens, but I was just wondering if anybody else has had the success yet. Wow, that's awesome. That is a huge, that is a huge rebate. And um, I would love to hear about it when they, when they get the money. Um, I will say I was, I did a similar training with, um, with Hugin and Katie a few months ago, and there was, there was less information. Um, so we are definitely progressing as the IRS kind of figures out how to do this on the first round. The last time we talked, we weren't even sure exactly when the, you know, when the paperwork would be out and now it is, and there's a process. And so it does seem like it is moving forward and please let us all know when you, uh, when you hear about the community getting a million dollars back, that is huge. Other questions, curious where, where folks are thinking about, uh, putting this into, to use. Um, I, so I live in Portland, Maine and, um, I saw someone else, I saw Seth on here from Portland. So Seth, maybe, maybe you've got some insight on this, but, um, I, my question is like, should I assume that the city staff or the city manager or the mayor of, of Portland, Maine know about this program and know about this opportunity? Or should I assume that they're not going to hear about it or believe it's true unless I, you know, organize a group of people to, to tell them about it or send them these resources? What are you, what are you finding as you, um, as you are, are reaching elected officials and city staff. Yeah, for sure. I can definitely say each city is different in terms of just the capacity it has and also just what its priorities might be. Um, we found like, for example, the, a lot of the um, cities we knew who may have been already familiar with direct pay, they probably had sustainability coordinators or some team like that who's like their staff is to, their job is to look for these opportunities, right? Um, but even so, we know that they have a lot of responsibilities and um, the reason why we do a lot of the work with, that we do is to make their jobs easier and to create these resources. Um, so yes, we still have encountered like organizations that are have more little limited capacity, haven't had time to look at these programs and would really appreciate more educational resources um, from organizations and you know to be able to push like it to be a priority in their in their government. Um, that's really where we see an organizing opportunity. Um, an example that we can think of um, is that the Cambridge um, City Council, they passed a resolution. Um, it was it was mainly basically an, I forgot what their term is, resolution, policy order, whatever. Um, but it was kind of like saying, we are going to officially commit to looking at direct pay and investigating um, where we can apply it to our existing um, sustainability plans. And um, I think based on the notes from that city council meeting, you know, people came and testified and said, there's funding out there and we want it to happen. We want to um, make sure that our, that Cambridge is taking advantage of it. So there's definitely um, all the support there, even if, you know, a city government has already heard about it and they're been able to hear, um, been made aware about this program. I think it never hurts to always encourage them that, um, that it is a priority and that you, that's something you want to see from your local government. Okay, that makes sense. So like, especially if, if you're in a small town or a small city with limited staff, then it makes sense to, to go to them proactively and be like, hey, have you seen this? This, you know, you could get free money. Um, and we'll, we'll maybe assume that, that folks in big cities are, uh, are at least in, in more blue states are, are aware. Um, Okay, I see, I see a great question up here, and I know you have a resource on this, but I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit more about, like, how, how are you seeing people cover the other costs of the project? What are the most, you know, what are the ways you're seeing? Yeah, for sure. Um, so one example that we always like to bring up um, is something that came from um that came with the help of a state revolving loan fund. Um, so in Texas, the city of San Antonio was um, planning this. It was actually, it's going to be the second largest municipal solar project. Um, so that requires a significant amount of funding. 
Um, they're using some of their, you know, city funding, but to be able to bridge a lot of, you know, the gaps and be able to afford all the money for an upfront project like that of that scale, um, they borrowed two and a half million dollars from, it's called the Texas Loan Star Program. Um, it's a revolving loan fund, so basically that means um, um, entities like the city of San Antonio can borrow some money from this program, um, and then when they pay it back, that will go back into this loan and then be used for, you know, the next lender. Um, this loan fund is specifically for um, public entities, so like cities, schools, um, so forth, municipalities in Texas. Um, to do energy related projects. So this one was solar. I think for that fund, they can also do retrofits. Um, but that's kind of, we always like that example because um, we're trying to encourage states and local governments to beef up programs like that to create revolving loan funds um, that are you know specifically created with um, clean energy projects in mind. Um, another important like source of funding is I would say green banks. Um, this kind of depends on the state because I don't think we're unfortunately in a place yet where like every single state has a green bank, but green banks are basically financial institutions um, that are usually mission oriented um, and they specifically look to fund um, clean energy, climate related environmental projects. Um, since, and I think because those are specifically in the clean energy and green space, I would expect them to know that there are federal tax incentives like direct pay so that they know that when they make a loan um, for a clean energy project that's eligible, they know that the financial risk associated with that is much is much lower because they know that um, an entity paying them back will have a little bit of a boost from direct pay tax credits. Um, but yeah, I think we have kind of more examples and go into it more in our report. Those are the ones I'm thinking off the top of my head. Um, and as my colleague Katie mentioned, there is a big chunk of money from the federal government called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. It got allocated to other sorts of financial institutions um, that are helping um, distribute um, the money. Sometimes it's in a lending role, sometimes it's more on a technical assistance level. Um, and one of the programs under the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is in particular called Solar for All. And that's to fund um, solar projects for um, low to moderate income households. So they have a website with the EPA where you can look up whether um, a grantee serves your state and whether they would have programs that you could potentially look to see if they can be a resource. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, another question on a similar vein as the, the question about local elected officials. I used to live and work in New Hampshire and there was a renewable energy, like there was a solar company that was always out and about and talking to people and mostly they were pushing rooftop solar, but that, you know, they also were working with different municipalities. And I'm curious whether it's safe to assume that a local solar developer or maybe even not a local solar developer like are are solar developers pushing this and are solar developers talking to potential customers about this opportunity when you know when they go about their business of trying to get municipalities to put solar on their high school or their dump or, or wherever it may be yeah, for sure. I mean, so in a lot of our outreach work, just in our personal experience, we mainly were like putting out resources with the our intended audiences, tax exempt entities. But in our work, we have encountered a lot of people who do solar installations and solar developments. Some of them are for profit and some of them are more in a nonprofit um, um, space. So I think that tells me, I mean, that these are definitely the more proactive folks, but they are thinking about it because they know that solar is an investment um, and that anything that they can offer to their customers like a tax incentive would be helpful. So that hasn't been like a particular point of outreach just for our organization specifically. Um, but we know that some of the, I think the tax was like 501c6, some of the business leagues that work on solar that try and support the solar industry um, who are a little bit more in the know about federal incentives and things like that, they definitely know about it. Um, Although this is kind of on a separate note, but what we've heard from some communities is that there are some predatory solar companies and like borderline like scams out there. Um, so something that we know is still needed is like um, that 
that some entities who are pursuing solar for the first time are really pairing up with organizations who know like the credible um, and, you know, hopefully like mission oriented solar providers um, so that they can get their solar from a trusted source and who would, you know, be more informed on, um, you know, tax credit like these. So, for example, like we've heard things like that from Green the Church. That's an organization that specifically works to um, help Black churches go solar. Um, so that's why like a lot of the, I know some of our advocate friends in the solar space are working on to make sure that there are trusted resources for folks to rely on. Okay, yeah. Please, if anyone on this call hears about examples of those scammy solar companies or hears about people getting offered loans that look really good, but then aren't so good after a couple of years, anything like that, please do um, let us know at 350.org. We are um, in touch with some folks um, like the folks at Americans for Financial Reform who are looking into this issue more. And, and we really do want to make sure that as this money is spent, it is spent in a mission driven and, and positive way. And, you know, unfortunately, there's always going to be someone out there trying, trying to skim a little bit off, off the side. Um, any other questions from the chat, please go ahead and, and put them in. Or if you can't work the chat, go ahead and take yourself off mute and, and jump in. Um, I've got one more question. And I, I'm wondering, is anyone track, is any institution tracking all of the money that's going from direct pay and the other federal incentives into clean energy? Like is the American, is the Center for American Progress or like is anyone else running a website where I can go on and see like what funds has Maine accepted from the IRA? Yeah, I know um, there are some, there's something called, I want to say it's from by Center for American Progress. I want to say it's like literally the investment track or something. I'll have to look up the specific resources. Um, but yeah, there are some um, policy organizations and think tanks who are really just trying to keep track of like um, how much money is spent and where it, where, where it's going, which states uh, for this exact reason to make sure it's distributed equitably. Um, but yeah, as I kind of alluded to earlier for like direct pay specifically, we're still trying to urge Treasury to make sure that like, um, we would like some good reporting and numbers um, to get a better idea of how much, um, you know, um, I know a certain like budget was set aside, right, for tax incentives in the IRA. And we want to make sure that we're completely taking advantage of it. Um, so we're definitely still pushing for the government to the government agencies to kick in on that side. But we know uh, um, our, that people on the um, research side are still looking into that. OK, awesome. Well, um, I want to really thank you for your time, both both folks who, who came to listen and um, Tahijan and Katie, especially for your expertise and all of the resources. And um, don't worry about trying to capture everything in the chat. Um, we are going to send out, um, we're going to send out uh, an email to anyone who registered for this Zoom with a recording and, you know, copies of, of all of the information we've been talking about. Um Hijin, would you mind moving us to the what's next slide? Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, a couple things coming up. Um, in August, we are working with um, a bunch of 350 affiliates and 350 local groups to plan um, our country's first week of action targeting the utility industry. Um, so if you are interested in participating, um, and especially if you are um, working on a local campaign targeting your utility, we have an interest form that I am going to uh, put in the chat right here. Um, if you're not part of a 350 group, but you're interested in becoming a member of a 350 group in your area, um, you can find your local 350 group here, or you can email me Um and I'll put my email in the chat and in the automatic email that you'll get um, for joining this call. Um, but yeah, really just appreciate everyone's work on this and um, please keep us posted if you are you know, hearing about successes in your communities or if you're thinking about how to take advantage of this and you want to troubleshoot or think about you know, what's, what's working in different places, let us know. And we are excited to, uh, we are excited to talk with you about it.